Good morning and welcome to St. John's where whoever you are and wherever you are in life's journey, you're welcome here. Please stand and join us in song. Good morning, good morning. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here in person in the sanctuary. Hello to those of you watching at home. We have a very, very special Sunday today as we hold our annual meeting and also talk about our future path as a church. And we started today's worship service by saying, open the eyes of our heart, Lord, because so often, it requires that we open the eyes of our heart, our mind too, but our heart, in order to make wise decisions moving ahead. Today's message is about becoming a blessing, and many of you have already lived into that message. You have become a blessing. You have helped others during this pandemic. We've had babies born. We want to say hi in the back to baby Claire. We're going to keep our distance to keep her safe, but this is her very first Sunday in the church. So let's keep the family safe and keep our distance, but it's wonderful to have them here. I know many of you have made a special effort to be here today. But as on all Sundays, we invite you to come when you can, come as you are, but prepare to be transformed. Because our faith is 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not. And we're going to say it one more time for posterity on the eve of our annual meeting. Our faith is 2,000 years old, but our thinking is not. Please share the peace of God with one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Blessed are the poor, the downtrodden, and despairing. They will rejoice in God's reign forever. Blessed are those who weep, who are grieving. They will be comforted in God's reign forever. Blessed are the ones who seek justice and righteousness. They will find it in God's reign forever. Blessed are we when we love our neighbors and seek their needs. We will live in God's reign forever. Blessed are we all when we seek to serve others in God's name. Let us worship together, serving one another and serving our mighty God. This morning is from the book of Psalms, the first chapter, and it can be found on page 493 in your Pew Bible. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, 
and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Our Gospel reading this Sunday is from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, some verses that are called the Beatitudes. You'll also find these in the Gospel of Matthew, but see if you can hear the difference in Luke. Luke wrote it this way. He said, Jesus came down with them, meeting the disciples, and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch Jesus, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then Jesus looked at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And then he goes on in more blessings and woes, but I especially like verse 23, where he said, Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Here ends the reading. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back from vacation. It's so nice to see your faces and especially to see all of the kids who are with us today. Hey, you want to hear a story? <laughs> no? <laughs> We're running laps. That's awesome. We love Jacoby. So we have a holiday coming up. Come on. We have a holiday coming What's our holiday coming up this week? Valentine's Day, that's right. And this is one of my favorite Eric Carl books. It's really small. It's one of his more recent works before he passed away. And I think I've read this every Sunday before Valentine's Day at St. John's for a couple years. And what do you do with good books? You read them again. So this is Love from the Very Hungry Caterpillar. But the first time I read this book, I imagined and I pictured myself sitting in God's lap with God reading this book to me. So if you're able to imagine that, not everybody was read to as a child, and so your image of sitting in God's lap might be very different than the person next to you. But imagine this. Do you want to see my book? No? It says, you are derailing my children's message. <laughs> you are so sweet. The cherry on my cake. The apple of my eye, says God. The bee's knees, my favorite page in the book. You make the sun shine brighter. The stars sparkle. The birds sing, my heart flutter, says God. That's why I love you. The end. It's a sweet little book, yes? 
I agree. Let's pray on this message from God. We count to three and we clap our hands. Ready? One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for this reminder that you love us for who we are, not for what we do or what we don't do. Help us to share that love with the world. In Jesus' name, amen. God's still rolling stones, right? That's why we're still here, right? That's why we're all here today to hear about more stones that are getting rolled away in our lives and in our church on the eve of our 150th anniversary as a church. Can you believe it? How many things have you been involved in, yourself, really, that have, been, have lasted for 150 years? Oh, my goodness. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. 
O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, today's sermon is called Becoming a Blessing. And I originally had this nice, neutral, middle of the road, and I say this all the time about the Beatitudes, that kind of stitch it on a throw pillow kind of sermons. How many of you have heard those kind of things about the Beatitudes? You know, kind of platitudes rather than Beatitudes. So today is not about platitudes instead of Beatitudes, and I just made that up. But it is about a deeper message. And I wanted to return to a time-honored story to put this in context. And it's about a man who walked into a bookstore, remember those? To return a purchase. Maybe he sent it back on Amazon. But he said, it's a Bible, asking for a refund. And the store clerk said, was it a gift? And the man said, no, I bought it for myself, and I made a mistake. The clerk said, didn't you like the translation or the format? No, the man said, the format was clear, and the translation was fine. I just made a mistake. And the clerk said, well, I need to write down a reason for the return, sir. And the man said, in that case, write down that there is a lot in that Bible book that is tough to swallow, right? There's a lot in the Bible that's tough to swallow. And today's lesson from the Gospel of Luke may be the toughest one of all. Theologian Paul Tillich once noted that students of the New Testament often find that it is not the refined arguments of Paul or the mystical wisdom of John, but the simple sayings of Jesus that are the most difficult to interpret. And I have a wanderer up here. Let me see. Do do we have a uh, parent? Here we go. I don't have my mask on. Hi. Oop. It's okay. I didn't mean to scare you. Hi. Are you here for today's sermon on the Beatitudes? Is that a yes? You want to get close? Oh, that's a yes. Well, we're talking about becoming a blessing church, right? There you go, straight to the altar, that's great. That's what we all should be doing, right? That's what you call an effective altar call, right? Right there. That's an effective altar call, thank you. Well, you know what, in our church, we welcome children, we welcome their wanderings, we welcome their giggles, their noise, their cries and their squeals, doesn't bother us at all. How many of you grew up in churches where you had to not wiggle or giggle, you had to sit still, right? Many of you, right? You couldn't, and it was all about standing up, sitting down, finding the hymn on the right page, kneeling at some point. Oh, goodness. Isn't it nice to be in a church where if you want to, you can come dressed up in a ball gown or a pair of jeans. Um, You can bring your kids, you can bring your friends, and it is all okay. So, when I return back to this scripture, And and just what happened here now, it reminds me of Reverend Carol Howard Merritt, who remarked that it's wondrous how the words of Scripture can travel through time. Here we are 2,000 years later talking about a Scripture that has traveled through time. But Luke's version of the Beatitudes is different than Matthew's. How many of you know that? Raise your hand. Own it if you know it. Few of you, seminary, put your hand down. Now he's got his MDiv, hangs up there. I know it. But Luke's version is different than Matthew's. And at first, it appears that Luke's version is simply the scaled down version of Matthew's Beatitudes in chapters five through seven. But there are some significant differences that impact us today. Because if we turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, we read this in verses 1 through 2. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountains, and then he began to speak. In Luke, in verse 17 of chapter 6, he said it came down, he came down with them on a level place. And you may not think context really matters, but you think about how often we talk in Matthew about the Sermon on the Mount. But we talk less often about Jesus' Sermon on the Plain in Luke. Somebody wants to be baptized. (laughs) Let me go get some water. I got some holy oil around here somewhere. Right? That's right. Well, in Luke, 
Jesus stands on the plain with the people, not above them. And Matthew seems to spiritualize Jesus' message. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And in Luke, and I invite you to read the Beatitudes this week as part of your spiritual discipline. Compare the versions in Matthew and Luke and see what you think. Because in Luke, we read simply, blessed are you who are poor, blessed are you who are hungry now. It's almost as if the teachings on the mountain are more abstract, but down in the valley, in the plain where the real people live, we understand the meaning of simply being poor and being hungry. I thought about this because we see it every week at the largest table. Before the pandemic, for those of you who weren't involved in the program, we fed hundreds their only hot meal of the day, often from our church kitchen every Wednesday. We never missed a meal when the pandemic hit, and we continue to serve meals. Raise your hand if you're involved in the largest table. Can we give these folks a round of applause? Because now we have to do this to-go meal, and, and it is heartbreaking to see people, even in the bitter cold, come and stand right outside here and wait for a sack lunch and now we have hot coffee and hot soup or hot chili or something hot that they can take with them. It's heartbreaking. You may not know that one in five children in our Ohio communities today don't have enough food to eat. Sometimes now we call them food insecure, but maybe that's because that's more palatable than being hungry. Now, I share all of this because this is part of our mission as a church. Part of our mission as a church is feeding the hungry and providing resources and solace to those who don't have enough in our community. And not every church has that mission, but we do. And you'll hear more of it during the annual meeting. But the problem with this kind of ministry, and we might want to shut that door if that noise is getting to be, are we doing okay over there? Everybody good? All right, and we'll make sure that Miss Mary is back there as well, our nursery helper, thank you. But I mention all of this because the challenge with this kind of ministry, you're going to hear it during the annual meeting, is that we literally give everything away, right? We don't sell stuff. We don't make a profit. We give it away, just as Jesus challenged us to do. And that makes our work together challenging. Not impossible, but challenging. But it is biblical. So... In Luke's Beatitudes, they are flatly literal. And Jesus is teaching us how to be a blessing to other people. And even if you learned about the Beatitudes as a child, I want to tell you they're not the be happy attitudes. They're not meant to be that. Beatitudes means blessings. I didn't read the section on woes from the scripture today because I thought people kind of had enough burdens to carry around with, without hearing woes from the pulpit. But the blessings and woes in Luke offer us a foundation for the kind of upside-down holy living that is celebrated in Scripture. We are supposed to live in an upside-down world, and not in the way that the world understands. But it is not easy. Now, I want to set the stage even more deeply for this passage. Because in the time of Jesus, his land was ruled by wealthy men like Herod and Caiaphas, they were cool kings who ruled the land and the people. They were kings who were aided by hierarchical religious leaders who prayed over the kings in public and then ranked the remaining people by family connection, ancestry, gender, class, and the weight of one's pocketbook. These cruel leaders used fear and threats to try to persuade people that some people were better than others, some were more worthy, some were more blessed than others. And Jesus came and promptly turned that concept of blessing upside down. He literally turned it upside down. How often do we glorify greed and avarice, right? Remember the movie Greed is Good? That line from the movie, from Wall Street. But Jesus turned this concept of blessing upside down. 
Instead of pronouncing the rich and the powerful and the war makers as blessed, Jesus said, blessed are the poor, the meek, the peacemakers, the refugees, people like the huddled masses yearning to be free who came over a long time ago with nothing to start this church, with nothing but faith. So, how does this translate for us today? Because I only have a limited amount of time. How can we apply this teaching to our daily lives? So for those of you who've tuned out during the history, tune back in, because I'm gonna give you some practical applications. You might wanna write them down on a piece of paper or put them in your phone. The sermons are also printed afterwards each week and we can send them to you or you can get them in booklets in the church office. But I wanna take just one aspect of this biblical narrative for us today. And it's about the importance and the power of communication about how what we communicate and the way we communicate can have a dramatic impact on other people. Because think about this for a moment. Communication can bring joy or sorrow, gladness or sadness. It can pick people up or knock them down. When we communicate, we can bring someone else pleasure or pain. We can be peacemakers or heartbreakers. We can be peacemakers or heartbreakers. And over the years, I have come to realize as I study these scriptures that in living each day, we have a choice. No matter what your context is, each day we have a choice to be a blessing to others or not. We can build up or we can tear down. And I've learned in my life that the spiritually happiest people are those who realize that we have that choice that being a blessing to others can be the greatest blessing of all, even if you're giving it all away and it makes no sense. So let me focus for a moment, and here are some things you may want to write down. I want to focus on just one of the Beatitudes about being a peacemaker. And I want to give you three ideas for peacemaking in your own lives, because some of you are like, I get the scripture, but I don't know how it applies 2,000 years later. So I want to give you three ideas for peacemaking in your own lives. It applies to us individually, in our families, in our work, in our church, and in our wider community. Because the choice is yours. You can, number one, encourage or you can discourage, and I'll cover each of these. You can either encourage or discourage. Number two, you can laugh or you can lament, sometimes both at the same time. And number three, you can pardon or you can punish. So I want to just take a moment and and get just really practical with you that, number one, you can encourage or discourage. Do you all know what I'm talking about in your daily lives, whether it's with your kids or other people that you know? Because the world has its share of cynics. The world is longing for encouragement and assurance. I always say that sometimes my job is to be chief coach and encourager. My title says senior pastor and teacher, but I think sometimes what it means is chief coach and encourager. Because people don't want to be put down. They're crying out literally to be lifted up and encouraged, especially as this pandemic continues. In Laura Huxley's book, You're Not the Target, she puts it well when she says, at one time or another, the more fortunate among us make three startling discoveries. Number one, each one of us has in varying degree, the power to make others feel better or worse. Number two, making others feel better is much more rewarding than making them feel worse. And number three, making others feel better generally makes us feel better. And you might be wondering, well, where is the support for that in the Bible in addition to the Beatitudes? And I wanna remind you of one of the great personalities of the early church. How many of you know the story of Barnabas? How many of you remember Barnabas? It's a great name. Now, I don't know that anyone's recently named their child Barnabas, but it's a great name because it means the child of encouragement. Barnabas was a significant leader of the New Testament church because he lived out his name. He was an encourager. I I encourage you to look up more about his story. We don't talk about them often enough. But we in the church ought to be today modern-day Barnabases, 
the sons and daughters of encouragement, people who listen, who care, who affirm, people who help one another and support one another, no matter the circumstances, and people who lift up and build up everyone. So you can either encourage or discourage. Now, number two, part of this teaching is that you can laugh or you can lament, and often you're doing both at the same time. Now, I'm not talking about things like clinical depression and brain biochemistry and mental health challenges, and I'm not talking about those who are in the midst of devastating losses and grief and heartache. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the everyday choice about which pair of glasses that you wear, your glasses of lament or your glasses of laughter. Now, you may say, well, is that really biblical? And I thought about all of those situations where we have a choice. We have a choice how we approach situations. Do we do it with an open heart and a hearty laugh or not? Think about the classic example of how we approach a toddler who spilled milk for the umpteenth time out of that brand new sippy cup, right? How do we approach that? Do we lose our temper? Do we lament the situation? Or do we laugh and pick it up again and help the toddler learn? Because it takes something like our pediatricians will have to tell us like a hundred times for kids to learn something. That's why we got to repeat it all the time. It actually takes them time to learn it. There was a saying once by Sir Max Beerbohm. He said, it's strange when you think of that, that all of the countless folks who have lived before our time on this planet, of all of them, not one is known in history or legend to have died from laughter. Have you heard that before? Do you know anybody who's ever died of laughter? No. Even Abraham Lincoln, who is famously pretty craggy-faced in his pictures and not looking quite jolly, he said, with the fearful strain that is on me night and day, if I did not laugh from time to time, I would surely die. How often in the midst of tragedy and grief and loss and heartbreak does a joke or a funny meme or something from a friend make you laugh in the midst of your tears? How often has that been life-affirming? I see some of you nodding. It makes all the difference. It's important for us to help others experience their feelings and journey with them and laugh even in the midst of tough circumstances. And then third, when it comes to communicating, and this is how the author puts it, that you can pardon or you can punish. But I thought about it that in this way, that every time I see a bumper sticker that reads, I don't get mad, I get even, it actually makes me sad. Have you seen those that says, I don't get mad, I get even? And, and I, I understand it, right? But it makes me sad because learning to forgive is so important for our long-term emotional health. Nobody is perfect. We all make mistakes, and relationships in any context are difficult. And unless we learn how to communicate and forgive, it's almost impossible to forge the kind of encouraging and loving relationships that are redemptive. Now, I'm not talking about the need to hold wrongdoers accountable for their crimes. That is a given. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the everyday hurts and grudges that get in the way of our relationships with other people. And I always say, some of you who are preparing to get married, you've, you've heard about this book. There's one book, if I, I like to be a resource-based pastor, if you have not read The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by the Gottmans, I encourage you to do so. Go to their website. They have all kinds of materials and videos and books and all kinds of stuff. And what the Gottmans say after decades and decades of research is that relationship repair is the biggest predictor of a happy marriage. Did you know that? Did anybody know that the biggest predictor of a happy marriage is not perfection, but relationship repair? Have you ever heard about that? It's not whether you don't make mistakes, it's whether you repair the relationship. And Relationship repair involves determining whether that relationship is worth it or not, and being vulnerable enough to try again when it is. It is an essential part of our humanity, not just in coupled relationships, but in friendships, in church relationships, in work connections with our neighbors. 
Well, that's enough of the practical stuff from this sermon in terms of how we live our lives as a blessing to others. Because we've reached perhaps the most important point about Jesus' Beatitudes in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. Because Jesus isn't just describing something in the Beatitudes, he is performing something. Jesus is not just describing blessed people, he is actually performing a blessing on the people that he's describing. He is saying, in effect, those of you who have lost hope, God bless you, you are beloved. Those of you who are suffering the loss of a loved one, you belong to God and to us, and you are invaluable. Those of you who have sacrificed and given up so much for the sake of others, God's face shines on you every day. Those of you who have been beaten and abused for standing up for what you believe in, you are precious in God's sight. Those of you who hunger now will be filled. There is enough. God isn't telling us how to be blessed with the Beatitudes. He is blessing those who have never been blessed. And if you think about it, each of us, each of you gathered here today, each of us, all of you watching online, we in fact need a blessing to go and do what we're going to do and to be who God is calling us to be. We actually need a blessing to do that work. So it's time for us on the cusp of this historic annual meeting, on the eve of our 150th anniversary this summer, it's time for us to live more deeply into our call to be a blessing church as we approach today's historic annual meeting. And I don't have a slide for this, but we have a video coming up in just a moment. I wanna define this for you, and I hope you take this definition home. A blessing church is a church that blesses people to go and do what God has called them to do as we seek to live on earth as it is in heaven. And that may or may not make sense to you right now. And it may or may not make sense to you that we would do this right before the annual meeting, but it's essential for us to proceed. And I don't expect this to be something that will be familiar to you, so I'm going to have us practice it for a moment, because this is a participatory sermon, whether you thought it was going to be or not. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up now, as you're able. Some of you are half asleep already. We're going to have video after this so you can go back to sleep, but this is the participatory part. Because we cannot go into our business meetings without blessing one another, not just greeting one another, just not talking about facts and figures, but blessing one another and our ministry and our church. And I'm going to ask you to turn to someone that you do not know. You might have to turn around in your pew or get out of your pew, keep your masks on, but turn to someone near you and you say, God bless you and keep you slowly and look them in the eyes when you do it. And then they do the same for you. And we're going to do it a couple of times. It's God bless you and keep you. Can you all do that with each other for a moment? Let's just surprise each other a little bit here. It's God bless you and keep you. You do not have to genuflect or make the cross. Just God bless you and keep you. For all of you who are new here today, I thank you for your courage and vulnerability in participating in this because we do have sometimes what I call spiritual pop quizzes and participatory sermons because we cannot do what we are being called to do here today without blessing each other and without being a blessing church. Because in order to be a blessing church, I hope that your hearts have been opened right now when you realize that someone would bless you, that you didn't even know that someone would bless you. Because with that blessing then, we are called to go out and bless others. Thank you. Blessed are the agnostics. 
blessed are they who doubt, those who aren't sure, those who can still be surprised. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who've buried their loved ones, for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who've loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables, the laundry guys at the hospital, the sex workers and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, for Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the ones without lobbyists. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kind-hearted NFL players and the fundraising trophy wives. And blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. God bless you all. Let's go bless some people. Amen. We have reached the time in our service for our offering, and Hank is coming today to share a message with you. But I want to encourage you, if you've not had a chance to make an offering to the church for a while, please, please take a moment, catch up. Um, we appreciate everything uh, that you have gifted us with. It makes all the difference in the world. We have a generous congregation, and we appreciate you. You are beloved, and you are a blessing. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Let's pray. May what we give today be blessed, and may all that we receive today enrich our lives and the lives of others. Amen. Tis grace that brought 
me see this far and grace will lead me home my burden's gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me just like a flood his mercy reigns Unending love, amazing grace. Well, my God has promised good to me, whose word my hope secures. God will. As long as life endures My burdens go I've been set free My God, my Savior Has ransomed me Just like a flow His mercy reigns Ten thousand years Bright shining as the sun We've no less days to sing His praise Than when we first begun Please stand as you are able. We pray now as Jesus taught us to pray 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory 
forever and ever. Amen.
find your feet. It's been wonderful to have you here in worship today with us in person and online as you prepare to move on with the rest of your day. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace while you go forth to live the gospel as a blessing to all. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being here today. And for those of you who were just visiting, we are transitioning to our annual meeting next. There are, there's some food in the back. Normally I would greet you, but we're gonna be getting set up for the meeting. So you're welcome to uh, take a bit of time, have a break, get some snacks, um, and then we'll start the year in pictures in about 15 minutes or so. But before you do that, we have a very special postlude today to get us in the right mood for our annual meeting. Thanks be to God. <laughs> 